It's a delight to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction. What a privilege it is to be here at Southern Seminary. I bring you greetings on my own behalf as well as from Dallas Theological Seminary. One of the earliest reflexes to appear in humans is the moral reflex, also called the startle reflex. It's a response to unexpected loud noises when the infant feels like it's falling and it's present in babies even in the seventh month of pregnancy. When they are startled, there is an immediate spreading out of the arms followed by an immediate drawing in of the arms, usually accompanied by crying. Don't try this at home on your little ones. You see, we are hardwired for fear. And yes, there are all kinds of things for us to fear in our lives. Fires, viruses, tornadoes, tanking economies, terrorism, imminent elections ministry issues, but the biggest of them all I submit to you is this. If you and I wear the t-shirt of Team God, then we'd better watch out because the Team God t-shirt has a target painted on its back. Terror is in order. Panic is called for here, despite Dr. Moller's reassurances, because Satan's got your number. If you didn't know, we are in a cosmic battle, and we are partnering with God in this grand program to restore the cosmos into its pristine state, and He chose to involve His team, us, in this glorious plan in, to, in this great battle of the cosmos to consummate all things in Christ, the war of the ages. And so the big question is, how do we fight this battle? No better place in Scripture to go to regarding battles than the mother of all battles, David and Goliath. So here we go. Please locate in your Bibles 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17, how to fight those battles. I'm going to dive right into the story in verse 4, 1 Samuel 17, 4. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, nine feet, nine inches at least in the Masoretic text. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, breastplate, which weighed 125 pounds. He also had bronze greaves on his leg, likely leg protectors, and a bronze javelin slung over his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 15 pounds. His shield carrier walked before him. Notice how the text lingers in detail over the giant's impressive wardrobe and armaments. Helmet, armor, greaves, javelin, sword, and a lackey carrying a shield probably covering his whole body. This is Mr. Universe, Hercules, and Tarzan rolled into one. No ordinary sword-wielding warrior in an age without gunpowder could threaten this hulk. He was invincible, impenetrable, impossible to touch. There was no defeating this guy. Verse 10, the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. And verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly Afraid. Who wouldn't be? The Philistine's outward appearance with his towering stature and his high-tech equipment was a horrifying sight. No wonder the Israelite army was terrified. Then the scene shifts. Right after the description of this Philistine 
invincible, impenetrable, impossible to defeat. And the statement that the Israelites were running scared, dismayed and greatly afraid, we now have a new character in the story, verse 12. Now David was the son of Jesse and he had eight sons. The three older sons of Jesse had gone after Saul to the battle in verse 15, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's flock in Bethlehem. So here's David staying at home guarding his sheep. This is no macho guy, no red-blooded swashbuckling ramble capable of engaging enemies, just a sheep herder. Anyhow, Jesse, the father, dispatches this youngest boy to the battlefront with food for his brothers, verse 23. And as he was with them, his brothers, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words, his defiant challenge. And David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the men, they fled from him and were greatly afear, afraid. They are terrified of the potential disaster that is staring them in the face. They are thinking about the danger to the lives and everything falls apart. But the problem is they got it wrong. This was not really about the army or Israel. So what was it all about? Let's find out. Verse 26, then David spoke to the men who were standing by. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And with that, David speaks for the first time in the Bible. The silence is broken. David opens his mouth. And he brings a whole new worldview into the picture. Until this verse, God is not mentioned in the story at all until now. The first time David speaks, and that's the first time God appears injected into the situation of hopelessness. David asks, doesn't believing in a living God make a difference in all of this? He centers the threat, the catastrophe around God, not around the army or Israel. God is at the center. This is not about military or national honor. This is about God. I want you to notice this in verse 10. The Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel. Goliath thinks he's defying the armies of Israel. Verse 25, the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he's coming up to defy Israel. The men of Israel think he's defying Israel, the nation, not just the armies as Goliath thought. But David, he thinks differently. Verse 26, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? No, Goliath isn't just defying the armies of Israel or the nation of Israel. This giant dares to defy the armies of the living God, God himself. Everyone else is thinking in two dimensions, giants, armies, defeats, catastrophes. David thinks in three. He adds God into the picture and the picture changes. This is about situations where God's name is at stake, where his reputation is on the line. At work, when your honesty is ridiculed and your integrity is stomped upon. In ministry, when your character is impugned and when attacks come unannounced. In missions, where hostility is palpable. In business, when you face hostility for making decisions that are moral. At home, where satanic addictions and sinful behavior may afflict loved ones. Situations where God's name and God's reputation and glory are maligned and disparaged. This is not about you or me. This is about God being defied. But you know, when you think about it, this means every situation, big or small, every facet of our lives, every aspect of our days, because everything affects God's glory. What is not important for God's glory in life? What does not affect His glory? What in our lives can be removed from the realm of the sacred? Nothing. 
Everything impacts God's glory, everything. And so, like David, we must be concerned about God's glory in everything in our lives. The driving concern of this chapter is the honor of God's name, the honor of God's reputation, the honor of God's glory. And here's a man driven with passion for the honor of God, overtaken by the glory of God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? A group of pastors in the 19th century was discussing the possibility of having the famous speaker D.L. Moody serve as an evangelist at a citywide campaign in the last century. One younger minister was reluctant to have Moody speak. Why Moody, he said. Does he have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? The question was followed by hushed silence. No one dared speak of Mr. Moody like that. Finally, an older pastor spoke up and said, No, son, Moody does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on Mr. Moody. Does God have a monopoly on you? Has He gripped your heart and captivated your passion so much that everything in life, big or small, important or seemingly inconsequential, we look out for the name, reputation, and glory of God. In everything, fight for God's glory. His glory should be our first thought, our last word. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? There he is, David, fighting for God's glory, willing to risk ridicule, willing to risk life, willing to risk everything, fighting for God's glory. You know, Goliath is named Goliath only twice in this story. Every other time, he's just the Philistine. Twenty-six times that label echoes in this chapter. And in verse 26, David adds yet another labor, calling him an uncircumcised Philistine. In Israel's eyes, the Philistine was undefeatable. In David's eyes, the Philistine is merely uncircumcised. Come to think of it, that's not very surprising. Goliath is about nine feet nine inches tall, and David's eye level, that's about all David can see, uncircumcised Philistine. (laughs) I hope this wasn't recorded. In, In any case, the fact that a living God exists gives one a whole different view of things. Who is this uncircumcised? This this is theocentric thinking, passionate about the glory of God, fighting for God's glory. But not everyone agrees, verse 28. Now, Eliab, his older brother, verse 28, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down here to see the battle. Who do you think you are, you pipsqueak, you whippersnapper? You've got nothing, no resources, no muscles, no testosterone. You're, you're, You're just a zero. Go take care of your little lambs with their fleeces white as snow. Get out of the battlefield where real men like me belong. But someone overhears David's bold words, takes them back to King Saul, who summons the young lad, verse 33. And then Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with them, for you are but a youth, while he has been a warrior from his youth. You fight with this giant? What are you going to fight with? You have no experience, no stature, no resources. You're just a dumb kid. So there are virtually three opponents that David is fighting here. Three. There's Mr. Philistine himself, all armored and bronzed, a nine-foot hulk. Goliath will later say, you're puny, no stature. And then there's Mr. Big Brother, who rages at David, telling the little squirt to get lost. He says, you're a zero, you're nobody, you have no resources. And then there's His Royal Highness King Saul, who disdains David as just an unqualified kid. He says, you're dumb, you're no good, you have no experience. 
And that describes most of us, doesn't it? No stature, no resources, no experience. How are we going to fight? But David's faith was not in stature, resources, or experience. He wasn't going to fight for God's glory with a flashy resume or a fancy degree or a glib tongue in the pulpit. Rather, verse 37, and David said to Saul, the Lord who delivered me from the hand of the lion and from the hand of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. He was going to fight for God's glory with God on his side. So Saul reluctantly agrees to let go, let David have a go at Goliath. Verse 38, then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with armor. Watch that carefully now. The similarities here with Goliath's battle dress. Verse 5, bronze helmet on his head and he was clothed with scale armor. Verse 38, bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with armor. The statements are virtually identical. Saul here is trying to match armor with armor, weapon with weapon, because Goliath has all his stuff and the only way we can defeat him is by being equally armed. The only way we stand a chance is to fight fire with fire, bronze with bronze. We need stature, we need resources, we need experience, we need muscles and might and guts and grit and degrees and titles and assets and reputations, guns and swords and uniforms. That's the only way we are going to win. That, folks, is the ideology of power, the reliance on force, the obsession with might. The world is full of conflict. Israel versus Palestine, Mac versus PC, Republicans versus Democrats. But let's get to the biggest battle of them all, shall we, at least in my humble opinion, Batman versus Spider-Man. <laughs> it's stupid even to wonder, right, because the Dark Knight would vanquish the web crawler without even breaking into a sweat. Which hero do you think has the R&D budget to stay on the cutting edge of crime fighting? The one with a secret hideout under his mansion or the guy who is trying to pay off his college loans? <laughs> Spider-Man disarms his foes with witty banter. Batman disarms them with batarangs, bat grenades, bat tasers, other sun-dry bat weapons, and he has a batmobile, bat boat, bat tub, and even a bath cycle. This guy clearly understands the importance of branding. <laughs> Spider-Man doesn't stand a chance because the guy with the most toys wins. The fascination with tools and toys, the obsession with status, resources, and experience, resumes, portfolios, achievements, the ideology of power. But we forget one thing, just as the Israelites did, just as Saul did. We forget whose battle this is. Remember, this is about God's name, God's glory, God's reputation. We are fighting for God's glory, and we're, when we are fighting for God's glory, we don't need toys and trinkets. We don't need stature, resources, or experience. So Saul rejects. David rejects Saul's stuff. Verse 39, David said to Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not tested them. And David took them off. No more the ideology of weapons. No more the ideology of force. No more the ideology of power. None of these things necessary to fight for God's glory. Instead, verse 40, he took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had and up with a pouch and a sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. Count those items with me, will you? Stick, stones, bag, pouch, sling, five. Guess how many pieces of armor Goliath had, five through seven? Helmet, armor, greaves, javelin, spear. The giant has helmet, armor, greaves, javelin, spear. The puny dumb kid has a stick, stones, bag, pouch, and sling. 
The giant is going to rip him into pieces. Verse 42, when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance, which is to say, pink cheat and fair complected. This guy is a dermatologist's dream. <laughs> but this little pipsqueak, ruddy and handsome, has one more weapon. His real weapon, verse 45 and 47. And David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And the Lord does not deliver by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. There he is, David, fighting for God's glory, remembering that God fights for him. You know the rest of the story. He kills Goliath because God doesn't need helmet, armor, greaves, javelin, spear. He needs one who is monopolized by God's glory, who fights for God's glory in every facet of life, at home, in school, through ministry, in everything. And in case you're wondering how on earth God expects us to fight for God's glory, statureless, resourceless, experienceless as we are, powerless, puny, pitiful and weak as we are, this story tells us God doesn't need the one with the most toys. He doesn't need the one with the greatest stature, the vastest resources, and the most experience. Rather, God needs men and women who rely on Him and on Him alone. Fight for God's glory, remembering God is your weapon. He fights for you. And that's why God expects you and me, even you and me to fight for God's glory because God fights for me. To remind us of that, I'm going to hijack an ancient Christian custom and try to kind of sort of rehabilitate that back to its original focus. The custom is the sign of the cross, a practice that arose in the early church. The core meaning of that custom was to serve as a reminder that God three fingers, came down from heaven, the vertical motion, to move me from the kingdom of darkness, the left, to the kingdom of light, right, at least in some traditions. I want us to make the sign of the cross a daily habit, but I want us to do it this way, saying aloud, God fights for me. Do it every morning as you lie in bed, God fights for me. It simply serves as a jog to our memories. God fights for me. His love sustains me. His grace suffices for me. His presence surrounds me. God fights for me. The Barcelona Olympics of 1992 provided one of track and field's most moving moments. Britain's Derek Redmond had dreamed all of his life of winning the gold in the 400-meter race, and his dream was in sight as the gun sounded at the semifinals in Barcelona. He was running the race of his life, and he could see the finish line as he rounded the turn into the backstretch, and suddenly he felt a sharp pain go up the back of his right leg. He fell face forward on the track with a torn right hamstring. As the medical attendants were approaching, David, Derek fought to his feet, it was animal instinct, he would say it later. He set out hopping in a, in a crazed attempt to finish the race. And when he reached the stretch, out of nowhere, a large, burly man in a T-shirt came hurling out of the stands, pushing aside the security men, ran onto the track and embraced David. It was Jim Redmond, Derek's father. You don't have to do this, he told his weeping son. Yes, I do, insisted Derek. Well then, said Jim, we're going to do this together. And they did, fighting off security men, the son's head sometimes buried in his father's shoulder. They stayed in Derek's lane as they hobbled together all the way to the end. The, the crowd gaped and then applauded and then wept. Derek didn't walk away with the gold, but he left with an incredible memory 
of a father who, when he saw his son in pain, left his comfortable seat in his stands to help him finish the race. That's our God, the one who sent his son to the earth to die for our sins. You cling to him. He fights for you. He'll help you finish the race. We can fight the good fight for God's glory because God fights for us. Let's pray. Our Father who calls us to fight, you are gracious to fight for us. What a paradox. What grace. What tenderness, what mercy, what love. As we live in fraught times, as Satan's attention is directed towards us, especially those of us who are in Bible college and seminary, seeking to thwart every attempt of God to restore his reign in a broken world particularly by trapping God's leaders like the men and women here. We are grateful for the encouragement and example of King David. Yet even more, we are grateful for the greatest king of all, our Lord Jesus, who as King of kings and Lord of lords is coming soon, until he comes. Father, would you through your spirit strengthen us to stand against the darts of the devil. Help us and grace us to fight with the confidence that you are fighting for us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.